It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Welcome, everybody. It is Monday, December 11th already. Can you believe it? Two weeks till Christmas. How are you guys? Good to see you in the chat room as I pick my nose live on camera. Um... Anyway, uh, today's show is going to be 10 big mistakes that can kill your sync career. And those of you who are regulars have heard a lot of these, but maybe a little more nuance added today and some new ones for those um, who've heard them all before, or think they've heard them all before. Um, but your power is major. Oh, I thought that was for me. I'm looking at the chat room. Um Anyway, I'm excited to share these with you, especially for new folks that have probably heard none of these before. So without any further ado, let's get right to it. Are you guys ready for 10 big mistakes that can kill your sync career? Waiting for... <laughs> Here, applause. Yes, the audience is going crazy for it. All right. Um, and welcome back, JP. Uh, you've probably been home for a while, but I remember you were going to Japan. I want to hear all about that. So here we go. The number one mistake. It's a big mistake to think that the music licensing business is the same as the record business. So many musicians that I've met, whether it's songwriters, artists, composers, producers, ha have grown up with all these beliefs, an entire belief system that was built around decades of people wanting to get record deals. And they've taken those same beliefs and carried them over into the uh, music licensing business. But they're different. They're really different. They, they both require music. and Maybe that's where the similarities stop. The record industry is looking for hit songs and hit acts. The music licensing business looks for songs and instrumentals that solve a problem which is finding music that can help to amplify a mood or an emotion or help set a place or even a time period in a TV show, a film, or in other forms of media. They're not looking for hits. If something is so hooky and so catchy and sounds like a hit and it's in a scene of a TV show, it might be so good that it's distracting and distracts viewers away from the storyline and the dialogue and what the actors are doing. So, to repeat it, it's a big mistake to think that the music licensing business is the same as the record industry. They really are different in many, many ways. Number two, it's a big mistake to think that film and TV music supervisors are like record company A&R people. Again, this is another hangover from the many, many years, if not decades, that people wanted to get a record deal. They wanted to get their music heard by an A&R person. That was the person who brought you into the company, got you signed. Um, and for some reason, there seems to be a misguided belief out there that somehow A&R people and music supervisors are both hit makers. They're not. Now, it could be said that a music supervisor who puts your piece of music, your song most likely, um, in a huge TV show or a huge film and a lot of people shazam it and then add it to their playlist on Spotify, that that in effect could be the thing that breaks your act. But it's not the same as an A&R person who's looking for acts to sign that are great songwriters that are out touring and building a fan base, that have a big social media fan base. It's a whole different set of circumstances. So... Let's see, I made some notes here. Uh, music supervisors don't pick music or acts that they think will be a hit. They don't sign or take a financial interest or ownership in the music. They license the music, which is essentially renting it for a, person, uh, a purpose. They license the music for scenes in media like TV shows and films. Getting your music licensed by a music supervisor probably won't result in having a hit although that could happen, as I mentioned before, if enough people shazam it. Um, and our people who work at record companies and publishers do take a financial interest and ownership 
and that's why they try and get your song cut or get your act to break. It's just different. Um, they're both in the music industry and they're both looking for music, but music supervisors, generally speaking, I'm sure there are exceptions because there are exceptions to everything in the world, but music supervisors are looking for music that elevates a mood in a scene or amplifies an emotion or sets a time or a place. They're not looking for hits. So there you go. I can tell by the speed at which I'm going through these, it's going to be a very short episode today. <laughs> Number three, it's a big mistake to think that music licensing companies and music libraries are going to shop your music. They don't. So many people I've met think that they actually shop their music if they sign you. Again, this is a hangover from decades of people thinking about the music industry in terms of record labels and traditional publishers. Uh, the music licensing, licensing thing has really only caught on in a big way in the last 10 years or so, even more so in the last five years, to where it's common knowledge for pretty much every musician. It used to be kind of just people on the fringe. But they don't shop your music. When you get signed to a production music library or a music licensing company in whatever form that takes, they don't start picking up the phone, calling everybody they can find that's making a movie or a TV show saying, hey, I just signed John's song. It's amazing. Can I send it over to you? <clears throat> Excuse me. Whereas in the record industry, in the publisher's side of the record industry, they do sign either, they would sign songwriters to long-term deals where they would get an annual stipend and all the music that they wrote, all the songs they wrote during the period they were signed to that company would then be, um, half of the publisher's share would be owned by the publisher. And they would, you know, proactively uh, pick up the phone, send emails, whatever form of communication and reach out to people in the industry who managed acts or produced acts or had signed acts that they thought would be a good fit for the songs that that songwriter that they had just signed uh, was creating. So there was a, a fair amount of outreach. Whereas the music licensing industry, people sign your music, put it in a catalog, and then basically it sits there on an electronic shelf, if you will, for could be a day, could be a month, could be a year, could be seven years, who knows, until the day where somebody reaches out to that company, to that production music library, that catalog owner, and says, do you have something that's like X, Y, Z? This genre of song um, could be, do you have something with this type of lyric? Do you have something that would fit in this scene? And that's when the music library or the music licensing company would then put together a playlist and send it over to the person who's looking for the music. So uh, I, I get a little brokenhearted when people are new to the business, the music licensing side of the business, and they, um, they sign something into a catalog and then they're like, I signed a deal a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, nothing's happened yet. It could take a long time um, because it really is driven more by need than it is by outbound pitching. It's reactive, it's not proactive. So there you go. Um, a regular publisher is like Warner Chapel or Universal Music Publishing or Sony, Sony ATV. Those companies sign songs, they typically sign writers, sometimes they sign acts who are also writing their own material. Um, but it, it's not like the music licensing industry where basically they are building a catalog of material that they think their client base would find useful. So there you go. Um, number four. It's a big mistake to think that your old songs or instrumentals are so good that even though they don't fit the brief, they'll get used. Um, and for those of you who may be new and don't know what a brief is, a brief is a written description of the type of music that's needed. So older music can sound dated, 
But most of the time, people are licensing uh, contemporary music. The, you know, that would be different if you're doing that 70s show or you're doing a film about something that happened in the 90s. Obviously, you want music from that decade, that era. Um, but more often than not, if I had to do a shoot from the hip estimate, I would say 80% or more of the music that's licensed every day is licensed because it sounds like it's current. Older music um, isn't likely to fit most of the key points in a brief. We see this a lot at Taxi. Other friends of mine in the industry talk about it, that they send out a brief, they're looking for a specific thing, and people send stuff in that has them shaking their heads. It's like, why would they send this in? It doesn't fit the brief. Well, maybe they see the brief, the musicians, the songwriters, the composers see the brief, and see one aspect of it, and they go, oh, I got the perfect thing. I recorded this six years ago. Even if it doesn't sound dated, it's not going to have enough aspects of what it is musically that are going to fit the key points that are required in the brief. So it's wishful thinking, and I think that the people who make those submissions, the wishful thinking submissions, are like, it's just so good, they're going to love it. Doesn't matter if it doesn't nail most of the key points. But... The more key points in a brief that you nail, the higher the chance is that you're gonna hit the nail on the head and end up with a license, so there you go. The odds are against you if you're hoping that taking an existing piece of music that matches one key point in the brief, like maybe the genre, or maybe it's emotionally up-tempo, or maybe it's guitar heavy, <laughs> whatever the aspects of the brief that your thing matches. Um, the odds are slim. I, I won't say never, never say never, but I, I will say that the odds go down, go down dramatically if you don't hit several, if not many, of the key points in the brief. So what taxi members who are successful have figured out is that creating music in response to the brief dramatically increases the potential of getting your music licensed because it just hits more of the key points. That simple. Think of it in terms of visual art. If somebody needed a painting for their living room and the color scheme was sort of autumn inspired, the colors of autumn leaves, let's say, hues of burnt umber and red and orange and browns and uh, they asked you uh, you're a visual artist <laughs> for this um, they asked you to uh, they commissioned you to create a painting that's uh, three and a half feet tall by six and a half feet wide and has that color scheme of leaves you know that are turning color in autumn and you bring them a painting that is in fact three and a half feet high by whatever I said, six feet wide. So the size is right, but the color scheme is like beachy colors, like sand color and turquoise and grayish blue, just whatever beachy colors are. Clearly I'm not a visual artist. <laughs> Um, you could say, but yeah, it's the right size. Well, yeah, it is the right size, but it doesn't go with the color scheme of the room. So it's very analogous to music that fits some aspect of what they need, but not several aspects or not many aspects. So if it doesn't fit the brief, the odds of it getting used go way down, even though I know that some people just think, yeah, but it's, it is rock. <laughs> If they pick a song or instrumental that they love that doesn't fit the scene, based on just they love that piece of music because it's so good, that's wishful thinking on your part because really they've made the determination of what it is they need based on the storyline, based on the acting, based on the editing. They're in post-production. So if they were to take that route of I just love this song so, so much that I want to put it in the movie. Now, that's thinking like an A&R person at a record label, right? But are they really going to rewrite the script when they're already in post-production and editing the film and laying in the music? Are they going to rewrite the scene and then call back the actors who are already on other projects in other parts of the world and bring back the crew 
um, and you would want to get largely the same crew members so you could match the lighting and the colors and the lenses, whatever, you know, people who shoot movies do. That would be virtually impossible. Not entirely impossible, but certainly very expensive, certainly unwieldy, um, and it just probably wouldn't happen. So you need to give them music that fits the brief and you're not depending on your music being just so, so good that the music supervisor or the director or the executive producer will just fall in love with it and say, okay, that's it. We're throwing out what we asked for and we're going to reshoot. We're going to rewrite, reshoot, re-edit, and then lay this music in. Not going to happen. Number five. It's a big mistake to not listen to your sync songs and tracks through the lens of usability. I'm going to repeat that one. It's a big mistake to not listen to your sync songs and tracks through the lens of usability. It's not about the song or instrumental being the best song or a hit song. Wow, crowd of people outside my window. I wonder if you can hear them. I had construction guys working right outside of my window before, but they went home. Thank goodness. Um, anyway, it's about the music's usability quotient. That's what I call it. Will a music licensing company see it as something that their clients will license time and time again? Because that's what music libraries are looking for. They want to make money with their music. So they're looking to sign stuff where they go, oh, I could see that being in all kinds of scenes. I could see this show using it or that show using it or this music supervisor I've been working with for years would absolutely love this. Um, so will the music supervisors and... Wow, <laughs> they are so loud. Um, Liz, could you run down there and ask them to move away from my window, please? They're literally like right below it. <laughs> it sounds like somebody's throwing a birthday party below my window. Anyway, I'm going to repeat that one. It's a big mistake to not listen to your sync songs and tracks through the lens of usability. It's not about the song or instrumental being the best song or a hit song. It's not about an instrumental showing off your prowess as a composer or a musician. It's about the music's usability quotient. Will a music licensing company see it as something that they can make money with over time? Will their clients come back and want to license this? Um, will several of their clients want to license it? Will they find it useful in scenes in the TV shows or films they're working on? Um, will it solve their problem by enhancing the emotion or the mood in a scene? Will it enhance the energy in a scene? Because sometimes that's the purpose of music. Will it help establish a time or a place in a scene? All those things make it usable. You know, we don't talk about that enough, about establishing a time or a place in a scene. But let's say you go, the opening scene in a movie, you go right from the few introductory credits into uh, a piece of ragtime music. That would put you in a certain place in a certain time period, right? Um, Country music may put you in a certain place or a certain time. Um, oops, I see Pedro's commenting here. For shows that are renewed, we often work with the music supervisor ahead of the next season to provide up to 100 songs for the upcoming season. Yeah, absolutely. They want stuff that they're going to find as usable. So they're not going to rewrite anything or reshoot anything, but they know the general direction. A, a, a good case in point to what Pedro is mentioning is that there are shows that maybe do a season where it ostensibly takes place in Santa Barbara. Uh, and it would, let's say we've got a show about a bunch of kids who are surfing around the world and season number three, they're surfing in the Santa Barbara area. Uh, maybe season number four, they've moved on to Australia or Hawaii or someplace else where the music would be different. So that's a good example. So they might reach out to the music libraries they work with before they even start shooting just to say, hey, heads up, next season we're not going to be in Santa Barbara anymore. We're going to be shooting uh, in Hawaii and the storyline is going to change. 
So you libraries that work with us would be wise to start putting together playlists of Hawaiian music that would be appropriate for that locale. Number six, it's a big mistake to think that you'll start making income right away in the sync business. Earning income in the music licensing business is a marathon, not a sprint. You've probably heard this a hundred times from your fellow members, but people repeat that uh, over and over because it's true. It's a long, a long process of getting many pieces of music into many catalogs over a period of time, and then having that music get used in TV shows, films, and commercials over a period of time. So don't expect to make much or make anything at all in the first year. Maybe you'll get lucky, make a little bit here, a little bit there, maybe not. Second year, you'll probably get a little luckier because you are, you've learned more about the industry at that point. You're hitting the nail on the head a little more frequently. You've probably gotten some music into a few libraries. They're reaching out to you on occasion for special requests that they have. All those things start making you more professional, I guess. Uh, and when that happens, more and more things will get placements, and over time, the placements result in money. Now, when you get a placement, does the money come to you like that week? No, even if you're getting a sync fee, it's not gonna show up in a week. A sync fee, by the way, for those who are, are new to the show, is getting paid upfront for licensing your music. So that could be anywhere from you know, a couple hundred bucks up to several thousand dollars. Typically, I would say the range of licenses for like a broadcast network show, um, probably 2,500 to 3,500 is a bit of a sweet spot from what I hear. Um, sometimes if, if in, let's say you're a baby band that's got some traction and uh, you've got a lot of followers on Spotify, um, maybe you'll get five grand. If you're a super big, well-known act and the song is something that's been a hit, um, maybe you get five to $25,000. There's so many variables, but typically it's gonna be more around that 2,500 to 3,500 range, depending. So that's the sync fee. But then you get performance royalties, which are generated when the show airs on TV or the meager royalties that you would get if it, it streams. Um, and those don't show up. You know, uh, the, the PROs in America, and I'm pretty sure in other countries, pay on a quarterly basis. But by the time the cue sheets are filed, by the time that data is entered into the system, uh, by the time the payments are generated, blah, 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 it's going to be at least a couple of quarters, if not more like three quarters to a year before you get paid. And if your placement took place overseas, let's say you're in the UK and the placement was in the US, or you're in the US and your music was used in a show in Japan, you can pretty much add six months to a year to the normal timeline because it's got to go from a PRO in one country to a PRO in another country and then to you. So. Nothing happens very fast, but I know this all sounds a little discouraging, right? The good news is that over time, um, it, it becomes cumulative. So stuff that you got placed two years ago has now started to generate income, uh, the money showing up in your account, and then stuff that you got placed 18 months ago. So it just starts to stack up and create a constant um, pipeline uh, of mailbox money, if you will. But that generally only happens if you're creating a lot of music and getting it into a lot of, a lot of catalogs so that you have a lot of possibilities and making the kind of music that those production music libraries or licensing companies uh, need for their clients because of the type of shows that they're working on. So it becomes a numbers game to some extent. Certain genres get used more than other genres, so that can affect how quickly your income grows. Um, certainly if you're doing, uh, I think my favorite example of late has been like, uh, you know, Dutch heavy metal. Uh, not a lot of requests for that, but yeah, Michael, I've got 20 Dutch heavy metal songs in four different catalogs. Well, I believe you, but those catalogs are not getting a lot of calls for Dutch heavy metal. So, uh, as opposed to somebody who's doing 
Um, singer, songwriter, love songs. Probably a lot more requests for that. Um, current sounding top 40 pop songs. A lot more requests for that. Um, hip hop with clean lyrics. A lot more requests for that. So things that get requested frequently because they are part of normal everyday life and the music that we hear in our lives, those things will get used more often and the money will stack up more quickly. But I want you to know that we do have taxi members who make six figure and even multiple six figure, not many of those, but a few uh, incomes. And it takes a lot of patience and a lot of persistence, but it can be done. Just don't expect it overnight. Number seven, it's a big mistake to think that it's wise to sign a lot of or even most of your songs or tracks with one company because they love you, they get you, they understand you, they appreciate you, and it feels so good. I understand that. Um, it, it's wonderful to be loved and appreciated. And there's nothing wrong with the companies that want a lot of your music, however, it would be very wise on your part to take a look at who their shows are, what the shows are that they work with, what their typical clients look for, because you may get a library that loves you and loves working with you and you're friends with the owner of the company, but maybe they, that company um, mostly deals in reality unscripted TV and they're looking primarily for instrumental music and it turns out that many of the shows they work on are kind of comedic, comedic and quirky. Um, so that's mostly what they get licensed and you could call them a very successful company. However, on occasion, maybe rare occasions, but on occasion they get asked for a broken hearted love song. Um, so if you put your broken hearted love song in their catalog, you like them, you trust them, you enjoy working with them, the relationship is almost family-like between you and them, that's great, but you might be better off putting that same broken hearted love song in a catalog where 80% of the stuff they license is songs for TV shows. Um, because a lot of broken hearted love songs get used in TV shows. And if what they primarily do is songs versus instrumental for unscripted TV, then you would stand a greater probability of getting your songs licensed, your, your broken hearted love song licensed by the second company. That's just the nature of who their clients are and the type of licenses that they usually get. So there's that one. Well. Wow. I'm halfway through and we're only 28 minutes, 28 minutes into the show. Um, I will go back and yeah, if you guys want to save up your questions, we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of this. Um, all right. Number eight. It's a big mistake to present yourself to the indus to industry professionals is a jack of all trades who can create music in many, if not all genres. And I can almost hear the chuckling of the people in the chat room because those who are regulars on the show know it. Those of us who are industry professionals, and I know I'm thinking of a lot of myself calling myself a professional here, but it's so true. And not just in the case of the music licensing business, but the same is true for the record industry side of things as well. If you meet somebody who's in the industry and they say, what kind of music do you do? And you immediately rattle off, I do rock, I do pop, I do country, I do R&B, I do a little bit of hip hop, and I do jazz. They are looking for the exit. They want to get out of there because they know that you are unrealistic and not a true professional in the industry and they will be wasting their time. Wow, a lot of activity in the chat room today. Um, so telling an industry pro that you create music in many of the popular genres is a dead giveaway that you're not very experienced. Industry pros know that most composers, artists, songwriters, and producers are typically good at one, two, maybe three genres. Um, it's always best to be honest about what your strengths are and hope that the companies and people you meet need what you've got. Don't lie about it or fake it. If, if they, you know, 
don't need what you do, sorry, it just doesn't work out sometimes. And if they need a lot of something that you're not good at yet, then take the time to study that genre because maybe you could become one of their go-to people if you really invest yourself in learning all you can about that genre and then start creating that. Then you can go back to them and say, hey, I do that. And you've got stuff that you can show them that hopefully would impress them. I'm going to take a sip from my taxi bug And remind you guys that today I'm going to give away this taxi mug. Used. Unused. <laughs> Later in the show, we're actually going to do a little drawing and Liz is going to pick somebody. And I'm sorry to say that once again, it really sucks and it breaks my heart to have to say this. But sending something like a book or a mug to somebody who's in the UK or... I don't know, Antarctica or the Middle East or South America or Tokyo, wherever. It, it almost, I shouldn't say almost always, it always costs way more to ship it than it does to buy it. So sadly, we have to disinclude our, our friends and viewers who are not in North America, which constitutes the United States and Canada. It's only a little bit more to send things to Canada. And if you slip a hockey puck in there, it seems to go faster. I don't know why that is. <laughs> um, okay, moving on. Number nine. It's a big mistake to think that investing a lot of money in building an elaborate home studio will, resort, will result in more of your music being signed and ultimately licensed. That's so not true. Don't ever think that it's a function of the more gear. I mean, don't tell your spouse this. But it's not a function of the more gear you have, the more money you will make. Um, the two could coincide, but they are. But gear is not a requisite, not a prerequisite either, uh, to creating music that people need. Um, I, I can think of three people. Let me think. Uh, Dean Crepain. Um, Dean still uses some sample packs, I think, that are somewhere around 15 years old, yet he knows how to use them really well. I'm talking strings, maybe horns. I've heard Dean track, Dean's tracks and go, wow, stuff sounds real good. And he, he says in his book, this is what I use, and it's stuff that most people would laugh at, but he's mastered it and knows how to make it sound real. Um, Matt Vanderbo. I was in his studio, the one, the famous studio built in the tool shed. Uh, he had nothing in there but a, a little MIDI keyboard, a pair of like $300 monitors, a $100 microphone, which I don't think he ever used, um, a trumpet, and kind of a mid-level iMac that wasn't like a supercomputer by any stretch. And when he started out, he, he literally knew nothing, but he figured it out. And he was able to, I mean, Matt Vanderbilt's got tracks in a gazillion libraries. And as it says on his website, if I'm not mistaken, his music can be heard every hour of the day all over the world. And yet he does it in a studio that's really basic and really stripped down. So I hate to invoke uh, something we've all heard a thousand times, but I'm going to do it. It's not the gear, it's the ear. Um, learn how to use what you've got. Um, train your ears so that you know what good strings and good horns sound like or contemporary drum sounds or really ballsy guitar sounds or an acoustic guitar that doesn't make your ears bleed because it's got so much top end. Um, learn that stuff. Learn how to balance a mix nicely. Um, learn about not putting way too much reverb on stuff because it sounds good, but it sounds really dated maybe on that type of music. So it's not the gear, it's the ear. And once you've got the ear, you will probably be able to use a very minimal amount of gear to get great sounds. So do you need to go spend 10, 20, $30,000? Absolutely not. Could you spend, let's say, 2000 bucks on a pretty beefy iMac, yeah. 
Um, then again, you've probably already got a, a computer. Um, can you find $200 microphones that sound really good? Absolutely. Um, can you find good monitors that are like $500 for a pair? Yeah, try a pair of KRKs. They seem to be very popular with home studio people. So bottom line is for not a lot of money, you can make great sounding music. So it's absolutely a mistake to think that investing a lot of money in an elaborate home studio is going to make you make any more money. It may bring you more joy and happiness because you've become a gear nut. I understand that. Um, but it's not going to get more of your stuff signed. And you know what? I know people that have a $300 string library and know how to use it well, and the stuff is very convincing. And I've seen people go out and drop 500 to 1000 bucks or more, and they still have the 15-foot-long bow when they play their strings. Um, they don't understand articulations. They don't understand how string players really play. Therefore, you can have the best sounding samples in the world, but you can butcher them by just not understanding um, how string parts are written, how string players play those parts that are written. Oh, Matt Hurt. I had him on my list of other people. Matt Hurt was probably the first taxi member to break six figures doing instrumental music. Um, he now lives in Switzerland. When he lived in the U.S., he lived about 20, 30 minutes from the taxi office. And I went to his studio, his house, uh, to interview him for a taxi TV many years ago, probably now like seven, eight, nine years ago. And it was kind of laughable. Uh, he, he would make a little fun of himself for having a very minimalistic studio. But Matt, uh, is, is born in Switzerland, um, thrifty by nature. He's a guy who didn't like go out and spend money on flashy stuff, buy a sexy car, live in a fancy house. Very good about saving his money, I'm sure. And therefore, he just bought what he needed to do what he needed to do. And he had a very minimal studio. If I remember, he had a pretty nice like 88 key keyboard, probably with weighted keys, just guessing. Uh, but nothing else is really fancy. Didn't even have a ton of plugins or anything. And to this day, Matt Hurt is revered by all the library owners who've ever gotten music from him. And he gets a lot of placements and does well. Um, Ken Mesford says he made his own watch as well. Um, now nah, he's Swiss. I don't know if he's that Swiss. Ken. <laughs> all right. Number 10. It's a big mistake to ignore genres that are considered niches or niches. I never know how to pronounce that exactly. I'm gonna repeat that one. It's a big mistake to ignore genres that are considered niches. My advice, when everybody else zigs, maybe you should zag. You might be one of many people doing, uh, or you could be one of many people doing the competitive high demand genres like hip hop or pop or dramedy which are needed for many, many productions. Or you could be somebody who specializes in the genres that are less frequently asked for, but you'd have a greater chance of getting a placement because there will be less competition in that genre within that catalog. So speaking of my friend Matt Hurt, um, I remember many, many years ago, Matt didn't keep it a secret, um, but he, he's, you know, not a braggadocious guy. He kept things fairly low profile, but he didn't do it to be secretive about it. One of the things I noticed that Matt was quite successful at doing is doing music, um, different ethnicities, different regions, different countries. Um, he would do like a full CD of Japanese music, um, probably incorporating some authentic Japanese instruments definitely incorporating um, a co-writer in many cases. Uh, I remember, I think it's Chinese music. He found somebody that he could collaborate with who was Chinese and was able to write Chinese lyrics for, Matt would create the instrumental tracks, his co-writer would create the Chinese lyrics and sing, sing those Chinese lyrics. Where are music libraries gonna get excuse me, authentic Chinese music, authentic Japanese music. Um, so authentic French music. Um, 
and find singers that could collaborate with us. You know, I see so many listings. I literally see every single listing that goes out the door at Taxi. And I see listings that are asking like for French cafe music. And it breaks my heart because I know most members aren't gonna take the time to go after that listing, that opportunity. And I think that they would be so wise to do so because you know what? Uh, it's never competitive at Taxi. It's not like you're competing against other members. Everything that's on target and is good ends up getting forwarded. But once you're in that genre, that category, in a production music library's catalog, you are then competing with the other composers and the other music that's in that genre or category. Because ultimately, somebody, whether it's the person at the library that's putting together a playlist to pitch to somebody who requested music, or maybe you are, or maybe a music supervisor is listening to the full playlist of what's in that category on their own. Um, so if you are one of 76 dramedy cues um, under the dramedy category, of course, in a catalog, your chances are, are de minimis because you've got a lot of competition. Whereas if you are one of nine authentic Japanese love songs with Japanese lyrics and Japanese vocals, you're gonna be one of just a handful or two. Um, and maybe they won't find anything at all. Maybe they'll move on to another library. But I think that while there may be far less requests for Japanese love songs, and I'm just pulling that one completely out of the air, um, it would be pretty cool to be a big fish in a small pond by going after that genre. So I think maybe blending those two approaches is the way to go. Should you do dramedy or hip hop or pop or some of the more popular requests? Yeah, sure, why not? But wouldn't it be cool to also um, do, you know, Japanese, Chinese, Latin, um, I'm trying to think of Germanic, uh, polka, you know? I mean, come on, how many of you have polka with lyrics, right? practically nobody. You could be the polka king or queen of the entire industry. What if you sat down and spent a month creating great polka songs and got five of them in this catalog, nine in that catalog, 11 in that catalog, two in that catalog. Pretty soon, you could be the polka king. So every year when they make beer commercials around Oktoberfest, whose music is gonna be heard most often? Years. Is that an evergreen pitch because it's something that comes up every year? Yep. So there you go. Uh, I think it's a big mistake to ignore genres that are considered niches. Okay. Number 11. It's a big mistake. This is a really good one. I'm going to repeat this. It's a big mistake to ignore music libraries that are outside of the U.S. market. Again, I see every listing that goes out the door at Taxi. And I've noticed, I know this because I own the company, but I've noticed that many of our listings will say this is a European company. It's a UK company. Uh, might say it's an international company outside of the US. It could be an Australian company, whatever. It could be Canadian. If you see listings that sound like or definitely are listings from companies that are outside of the US, I might pay special attention to those if I were a composer or a songwriter. Why? Because I also see every one of the success stories that comes into Taxi. And when I see those success stories, um, there are a disproportionate number of them that come from members of ours who are also outside of the US. And I'm not sure if they are more prone to submitting to companies that are outside of the US market um, I don't know why that is, but I noticed that they tend to get more placements than people who maybe just go up, uh, submit to straight up U.S. companies. So, uh, for instance, the, the first thing in our success stories this month was somebody that got something placed um, on the channel France 5. 
Um, I, I see this sort of stuff all the time. And I, I chuckle to myself and I think, wow, either they, they were really lucky or maybe they figured it out. But having your music in libraries that are outside of the U.S., um, in many cases, I believe the catalogs may be smaller. Um, in some cases, some of those countries, I know this because I've spoken to some of the library owners, they like having American composers in their catalogs. Um, and you know what? They're pitching at shows that the American market may not even know exist or they may not be going after. Now, could a behemoth like APM that has affiliate libraries under their umbrella, you know, and like a, a million different songs or tracks in their catalog and they're, they're global. Um, could they potentially get your song in something on France 5? Yes. But I don't think that's true for a good chunk of the libraries operating in the United States. So if I were a composer, if I were a songwriter, if I were a producer making tracks or songs for the, the sync industry, I would try and go for both. I'm not saying you should do one to the exclusion of the other, but if you've got your music in a bunch of American-based companies already, maybe take a three-month or six-month period and concentrate on the taxi listings that appear to be companies that are outside of the U.S. Therefore, you may have less competition within those genres in those catalogs. Um, they could be smaller. Um, in many cases, I believe they are. Uh, and they're pitching at stuff that the American companies probably aren't. So just saying, again, big fish, smaller pond, uh, more variation could bring you more revenue from different places. And I think that that is a good approach to take. So it's a big mistake to ignore music libraries that are outside of the U.S. market. Number 12, it's a big mistake to miss a deadline. I know that seems so obvious, right? It's like, who would miss a deadline? You'd be shocked. You would absolutely be shocked by the number of members. Whenever we run a listing that's like, you know, a $20,000 or $50,000 or $100,000 TV commercial or something really kind of rare and exceptional, It's and it's not like people don't have two or three weeks to get their music in. But those listings in particular, people wait until the last darn minute to start creating the music and they mix until two in the morning and the deadline was at 11.59 p.m. And the next morning my staff comes into work and they've got a bunch of emails and phone calls from desperate people who are like, I missed the deadline. But meanwhile, we've got a deadline and everybody else had a deadline. And, and the person who requested that music, they've got a deadline. We can't just say, oh, you know what? This person worked till two o'clock in the morning because they waited till the last minute. Um, so we need to push back our whole delivery because of them. Deadlines are really important. This isn't like high school where you get to screw something up and then take up a, a, take a makeup exam like you know the next day or a week later or something. It's you're entering a professional business environment. Act like a professional. Just meet the deadline. Do you really need to mix something 42 times? Do you think it's going to make that much difference whether your piece gets used or not? It won't. So if the deadline's at 11.59 p.m., whether it's a taxi deadline or you're already in with a production music library and have a relationship with them, um, no matter how much you feel the love from that company and how great you get along with the person who's your liaison at that company, don't assume that that gives you some special privilege to miss a deadline. The reason they like you and enjoy working with you is because something or many things that you've done in the past have indicated to them that you're a professional. Blowing a deadline is not one of those things. And frankly, um, if I were in the good graces of a company, Production Music Library, uh, and they say, can you get me this stuff by Tuesday at noon? I would get it to them by m late Monday night or at the latest Tuesday morning because that will put a little smile on his or her face on the receiving end and go, that's why I love working with that Lasco guy. You know, he never pushes it right to the max, never misses a deadline. As a matter of fact, he's always a little bit in front of the deadline. That's a professional. 
So it's a big mistake to miss a deadline. Just don't do it. Number 13. Um, it's a big mistake to not deliver what the brief asks for. Brief, taxi listing, whatever the case. If you want music libraries to keep working with you over a long period of time, then just give them what they need. Give them what they ask for, whether it's a music library, whether it's a music supervisor. Give them what they need. Don't try and cram something that's not really a good fit down their throat. They won't appreciate you, it or you. <laughs> it won't ingratiate you to them. Um, give them what they ask for. I know, uh, going back to what I said earlier, there are some people who believe that my song is just so good. Who wouldn't want to use it? But so good doesn't mean so right and they need right. Maybe they've guessed wrong. Maybe when they sat down and did their spotting session with the music supervisor and the director and the executive producer, um, maybe they thought that, you know, a brokenhearted love song would be the perfect way to end that scene. But then when they actually see some brokenhearted love songs against picture, they go, you know, maybe we should try a funnier approach. Maybe we should do something that's counterintuitive. Oh, yes, they're having a breakup, but rather than putting, a, you know, the obvious brokenhearted love song in there, maybe we should put a song in there about freedom or something that would be a juxtaposition to brokenhearted um, that would at least go along with the theme of the scene. So, yeah, they do make a bad guess every now and then, um, but give them what they ask for and, and they will keep coming back to you even if they don't use what they asked for, even if they made a bad decision as to what they thought they needed in that scene, just always give them what they asked for and they will love you for it. Number 14, it's a huge mistake to not deliver your music to production music libraries, music licensing companies in general, the way that they request it. Pay very close attention to the details as to how your clients want to receive your music. Some libraries have a portal where you can upload it. Some will ask you to send it to them on a disco playlist. Practically nobody <laughs> wants music, an MP3 attached to an email. Um, so yeah, don't do that unless they specifically say, which would be a very rare circumstance. Maybe if it's late at night and somebody's trying to make a deadline and they know you've got one thing and you're sending it, they may not ask you to send it to them in disco. They may say, you know what, just attach it as an MP3. That would be a pretty rare circumstance. So um, what else do they want? What, what type of file? Um, trimming the front and the back. Don't leave 30 seconds of dead air before the downbeat leave a split second of dead air before the downbeat and make sure at the end when your last note hits um, and you've got a reverb tail and a note ringing out on a piano or a cymbal or whatever is ringing out, put on the headphones, crank the volume up and make sure that that tail, whatever the tail is, is totally gone and then wait a beat and stop but don't let it go for 30 seconds or a minute. It's amazing how many people do that. Um, give them the type of metadata that they're asking for. Um, also give them, if they want alt mixes, mix minus vocal, um, maybe some stems, maybe some cut downs. Just give them what they ask for. They will love you for it. That's part of being a professional. I think it's a huge mistake to not deliver your music to companies in the way that they request it. It's like not turning in your test on time or getting your homework done. Just be professional and give them what they ask for. Number 15. It's a big mistake to make a public display on social media of negativity discontent or nastiness, even if it's not directed at a particular company. Um, that would be worst case scenario, directing it, you know, saying the name of the company out loud and, and 
going on TikTok and Instagram and X, formerly known as Twitter. Why can't we just keep calling it Twitter? <laughs> anyway, um, going on there and, and, and making a scene, uh, especially if you name the company, but even if you don't, other companies won't want to work with you because they will fear that you might do something like that with them. You might be, or very well could be, perceived as being a, a crankpot. <laughs> That's a nice way of saying it. Somebody who would be difficult to deal with in a professional relationship. Um, somebody who thinks they're right about everything all the time. These are things that are turnoffs to people who want to do business with you. So don't put it out there in the world. I mean, there is a website um, where people can go rank production music libraries. And I've always been uh, of the belief that the lower the bar is, the more music they accept, the more people like them. Um, and if they hold a pretty high bar as to where their quality or the quality of the music they want is, People don't like them because they feel rejected. And they go on there and they trash these companies, companies where I know the owners of the company, I know their business history. They're fine companies that if I made music, I would want my music in those catalogs. And people trash them. Why do they trash them? Because they didn't see the genius in my dramedy cue or my broken hearted love song, whatever. Um, or maybe, you know what, doesn't even have to be directed at a company or at anybody in the industry. It could be that two people are butting heads over some artistic thing, you know, like, well, I don't think the song needs a bridge. And somebody else thinks, well, you obviously don't know anything about songwriting. Whatever, any form of negativity could make them just go, you know what, this person is a little more trouble than they're worth. I'm just going to steer clear. And I've said this many, many times over the years. I used to say 10, 15 years ago, there is no blacklist uh, of people that companies, musicians, that companies don't want to work with in the industry. And I think at the time that was a pretty fair statement. There was no blacklist. But this kind of stuff has become so rampant. Um, and there are industry get-togethers. Uh, gosh, I haven't been to one of those things at the Sportsman's Lodge in a very long time. But, you know, there there are things that I've been to, and I'm sure I'll go to again, where I'm sitting at a table, a round table, with nine other industry people, and I probably know seven of them. Um, probably know them pretty well. I've known them for many years, and they all know each other. Everybody in the room kind of knows everybody. Um, and somebody's name might come up in a discussion, and believe me, those discussions often happen about, oh man, you wouldn't believe what I had to deal with this week. And in the end, somebody's going to say, do you mind telling us who that was? Um, I've seen that actual thing happen. There was a taxi member years ago that I actually was so utterly blown away by his songs and how perfect they were for a certain library that we worked with on a very regular basis. Then I picked up the phone, I called the library owner and said, I need to turn you guys on to this songwriter outside of taxi listings. Maybe you haven't gotten his music yet through our listings, but his music is perfect for the shows that you work on and the type of catalog you have. I made the introduction, the library owner was very grateful, said, man, you nailed it. This, this, it was a, a guy, this guy is perfect for us. <sighs> Sadly, the musician was a pain in the butt a real pain in the butt. Um, and, and the library owner called me up and said, you know, at that time when you first turned me on to this person, I really appreciated it. And now I don't appreciate it anymore <laughs> because th this person was just so hard to deal with. Uh, and sure enough, there was a, a scenario almost a year later uh, where that library owner and myself and several of us knew each other at the same table. And um, this, the, that story came up and other people went, oh, I know who you're talking about. Um, so while there is no official blacklist, at least if there is one, nobody's ever told me what the password is or where to find it. Um, don't don't assume that you can just be a loudmouth or a bully 
or an a-hole or anything inappropriate, uh, which I may have just been for saying a-hole in the middle of a family-oriented show, but don't assume that it's not going to leak out because it probably will. Uh, we live in an over-communicated world these days, so assume that everything you do could reach ears that you don't want it to. Just saying. Number 16. Oh, yes, by the way, I did come up with more than 10 of these. Um, this one's a small mistake. It's a small, and there are varying opinions on this, but this is my personal belief, and I'm curious. I want to see how many of you um, in, in the chat room agree with me on this. I personally think it's a small mistake to not try and include an organic instrument or some instrument played by a human being on a track for certain genres. I should put a qualifier in there. Um, but certain genres where everything is MIDI and samples, um, maybe even borderline uh, or overline, uh, overquantized, I think it's oftentimes for appropriate genres to overdub an acoustic organic instrument that is played by hand, by a human being. Uh, even if you're not a virtuoso, um, uh, probably the easiest and best example is there are times that things need a shaker. And while it's ridiculously easy to go into a sample library and add a MIDI shaker to something and you know it'll be right on the money, um, maybe you're better off grabbing one of those little egg shakers or a film canister with some pot seeds in it or rice or whatever you use for your shaker and do it with your hand. Actually play the shaker. Just that little overdub adds a certain nuance of humanity to the track that probably tricks the brain into thinking that it's not all MIDI driven. Um, I certainly know people that will take, uh, if they have access to a friend who's a pretty good violin player, um, could be viola or cello as well, or a horn player, whatever, and ask that friend to come over. Let's say they've done a whole bunch of MIDI strings on a big orchestral piece. Is it a good idea to have a real string player come over and stick a microphone three or four feet above that person and have them play along? Yes, because there's gonna be a certain amount of humanity or slop <laughs> in there. Uh, it's not gonna be as perfect as a MIDI track would be, and that somehow makes it sound more authentic and more realistic. Um, an acoustic guitar is another great example of something that's so idiotically simple to put on a track that I believe adds a lot of humanity. Um, just a, an acoustic guitar just doing open arpeggiated brown strums just on the one of every measure that can actually add a lot of humanity to a track so i think it's not a catastrophe if you don't do it but can you improve stuff by 10 15 20 percent by throwing on a track like that absolutely so any chance you get at least think about it would this track that i've created entirely in midi land just feel a little more human if I overdubbed a shaker or an acoustic guitar doing strums or a violin or anything played by a human. It doesn't have to be, it shouldn't actually be a part played by somebody who's a virtuoso on the instrument. Um, I mean, of course, you know, there are exceptions to everything. Maybe you're looking for um, a jazzy violin lead instrument or something, and you want somebody that's virtuoso. But I'm talking about just adding a layer of texture and humanity to just string pads. Bring in a violin player and just have them play it. And, and record it from like th with the mic three feet above and then maybe 10 feet away and then maybe 18 inches away from the instrument and try combining those and, and see what kind of textures and what kind of phase anomalies you get that may actually be advantageous and somehow make your stacks of, of strings that you created with sample libraries just sound that much better. So give it a shot. Um, and finally, um, this is number 17. 
It's a big mistake to try and sneak submissions in that have samples or loop. I should say unauthorized or unkosher, illegal. Um, there are many, many libraries that just don't want loops of any sort in there. And I think it's a fair statement to say that it's a rule of thumb that if you're going to use um, loops, make sure that there's no place in the track that they would stand alone, um, because if they do, that that is definitely not kosher. Um, and it could be that maybe somebody wants stems and you've provided a stem and one of the, the a stem of just that loop, they can't use it. Uh, it's absolutely not cool to stem out, uh, let's say, you know, a, a drum loop that is not adulterated, significantly adulterated in some way. Now, I've heard people say, I'm not a lawyer, by the way, um, and I'm not as expert on this as I probably should be, but I've heard people say, and I believe them, that if you're going to use an existing loop, change the sounds, change the, the key, change anything you can to make it unidentifiable. Uh, you know, if, if you're using um, a MIDI loop, can, can you take out some of, of the beats so it's not the same anymore and then adulterate the drum sounds and, you know, change the key uh, of the drums and add reverb, add distortion, anything you can do so that even the person who originally created it wouldn't easily recognize it as being their own. I've heard people say that. So, um, like I said, I'm, I'm not the world's foremost expert on that, but I think I've given you some good rules to play by. And there we have it. Um, I've just given you 17 things that I believe are big mistakes. Hopefully some of them are new to those of you who are regulars. For those of you who are new to the show, I hope that many of these are new to you and it saves you some pain down the road. Um, should we give away a mug? A mug like this? <laughs> I was actually going to make, you could ha have a choice of the blue mug or the yellow mug, but I've been drinking out of the blue mug. <laughs> I, I really hate to, first of all, I love the blue mug. Uh, second of all, because it is my favorite color blue. Um, and I would really hate to give somebody a washed out mug but I am going to take advantage of this moment and take a sip from my taxi mug. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is, and again, I hate to say this, but if you're outside of the U.S. other than Canada, please don't try and win the mug because, I mean, I think the mugs cost like 15 bucks. Um we would probably spend $30 shipping it to like London or somewhere. So um, generally speaking, we don't make the, the prizes from the contests um, available to people outside of North America. So here's what I'm going to have you do is when I say go and not beforehand and don't type it in 10 times trying to increase your chances of getting it. One vote, one person or one person, one vote, one chance, whatever you want to call it. Um, shipping to the UK is six bucks from the taxi swag site. Interesting to know. Hey, Marco, how are you? Good to see you at the rally, by the way. Um, well, you know what? I'll tell you what. If whoever wins, we are, I'm going to change the rule then for this particular thing, because I know it's not that way with Amazon. It's ridiculous. Um, there are a lot of things Amazon won't even ship to other countries for us. So... <clears throat> Anybody can enter this drawing, try to win the mug, and uh, rather than sending this one, if it's somebody outside of the U.S., we will just order one from the taxi swag site and because we don't keep a stash of stuff around the office, and I will pay the extra $6 to send it overseas if, in fact, the winner is um, from overseas. There is a taxi swag site, um, and there you go. Liz is putting it in the thing. Um, so now when I say go, type in the word mug and then Liz, who's sitting like 50 feet away from me in another office, is going to close her eyes, run her finger up and down the chat and go bink. And wherever her finger lands, that will be the winner, the person who gets 
the beautiful taxi mug. So without any further ado, go. <laughs> I love it, an actual mug emoji. Wow, I'm seeing some names in there, people I haven't seen in a long time. Karen Brasher just flew by. I remember that name from like two years ago, maybe even during the COVID stuff. <laughs> Pedro, mug me. Uh oh, KP says some of the people cheated. Bad. <laughs> Chalice. <laughs> All right, Liz is last asking <laughs> if everybody um, has gotten their their vote in. Looks like it. Okay, Liz, back it up, let it fly, and do your thing. Ben Berman. Yay! <clears throat> Congratulations, Ben Berman. Where are you from? I'm just curious. You're from Holy Money? I don't think I've ever heard of that town. <laughs> Northern New Jersey, awesome. Yeah, I used to live in Jersey. I actually did live in Jersey. Um, I lived in Scotch Plains area, like Scotch Plains Westfield off of beautiful Route 22. Well, congratulations, Ben. Send an email to liz at taxi.com with your email address, your ground address, your phone number, and we will pack up this beautiful, <clears throat> never used, this is actually left over from the road rally, um, pack this up and get it out to you in the next couple of days, and uh, uh, hopefully you will uh, get it before Christmas. Um, not far at all. I used to have a mother-in-law from my first marriage that lived in beautiful Fort Lee, um, Zen chief engineer said, mine still isn't even chipped yet. I know. I've got a blue one at the office and a blue one at the house. And uh, everybody in the family knows, don't touch dad's blue. I heard, I saw buffering, I just reconnected. Yeah, we lost you, thank you. Sorry about that, I have no idea what happened. It's rare that it just like pff, craps out like that um, with no like indicators of like low bandwidth or bad Wi-Fi or anything. Anyway, um, congratulations to Ben Berman. Thank you guys for uh, joining me for today's show. I hope you learned some great stuff about the 10 big mistakes that can kill your sync career. Um, and Ben, yes, send the email to um, liz at taxi.com and include your home address, your email address, which you'll see in the email, um, easiest phone number to reach you at, and Liz will get it packed up and get it out the door here in a day or so. And you will be um, receiving the mug, hopefully before Christmas. Um, yep, 10 mistakes turned into 17 mistakes. What can I say? It was Sunday night. It was late. I was writing like a fiend, and I just kept going because I had other ideas. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do for next Monday's show, but it will be um, a week before Christmas. 
somebody suggested that I do a show where we play um, Christmas songs submitted by the audience. I just have to think that through and think about if there are any legal issues because some of the people that might submit wouldn't be taxi members, blah, blah, blah. We'll come up with something. We'll let you know what it's going to be. Um, not celebrating Christmas here. Uh, are you celebrating Hanukkah, Ben? <laughs> I know I am. Um, so there you go. Um, thank you all for watching. And actually, let's, you know what, I didn't even think about it. We've still got uh, like 15 minutes left. Do you guys want to do Q&A or should we just call it a day? It's up to you. We could do Ask Michael Anything. Q&A, please. <laughs> couple want Q&A. Um, all right, so if you guys start typing in questions, I'll answer them for the next 14 minutes. Um, a micro quarantini happy hour, there you go. Um, all right, if you've got a question, just type the word QUESTION in all caps, and uh, we will see uh, if I've got a good answer for you. question like that <laughs> thanks marion um should we always submit radio edit songs first or both versions um you don't want to submit both versions and it depends what you're submitting for are you talking about submitting stuff for label opportunities or are you talking about submitting stuff for film and tv um film and tv doesn't really care about radio edits um uh, although people do tend to like shorter songs now, so if your radio edit has resulted in a shorter song, I would default to that. Um, I had a question, this is from Sound Arts, about using drum core for drum loops as part of a musical arrangement submitted to libraries. Um, is that the actual question or just an announcement that you had a question? <laughs> uh, what was the best moment that I had at the road rally? Gino rocks wants to know. Um, the best moment for me, honestly, is when it's over because it takes 90 days of adrenaline and tons of stress and just a million little details to the point where I, I wake up in the middle of the night frequently um just horrified like did i remember this did i remember that um so i love when we finish a road rally and i know that it went really well i've heard uh many nice things said about my staff from people who come up to me in the ballroom and say your staff is awesome and i go i know thank you thank you for saying that um i love the thing that biagio messina did um, I'm actually having dinner with Biagio and his wife tomorrow night. But he, did, in, in case you weren't in there, he did a two hour thing showing how he is an executive producer of a bunch of true crime shows and, um, and other uh, documentaries. Um, is also a very good composer um, and also edits his most of his own shows sometimes he'll bring in an edit crew so he really has seen the musical side of everything from all aspects and he and i were at dinner i don't know three four five months before the road rally and he was telling me how he uses stems in in a way that's so creative compared to other stem uses <clears throat> that I've heard of. And I thought, you know, this is really good information, not just for taxis members and composers, but I think a lot of editors should think of this. Um, and I, I started watching some of the back episodes of shows that he's done uh, where he was the executive producer, possibly or probably the editor on them, and also the composer. And the stuff sounds scored. Uh, he will take one instrumental cue and find five different ways to use it um, and pull parts of it out, pull stems out that most people I don't think would take the time to do. Um, but because he 
thinks about this stuff when he's composing his stems, it makes it quite easy to use them in that way. And I felt like it was really, really, really um, creative. And we are actually going to invite a bunch of production music libraries in LA, or if people want to come from out of town, they certainly can. And I think we're going to get the 200 seat theater at the West End and do a special presentation of what he's done, what he did at the Red Rally just for libraries. Because I think that a lot of libraries don't really understand how incredibly helpful um, this could be to the editors who use their libraries. And I know it creates a lot more work, um, a lot more work on the front end of you know ingesting that music into a library and tagging everything and all the different versions, blah, blah, blah. But um, in the end, the quality, I mean, just watching a couple of his shows, instantly the quality of the shows just felt richer, more expensive, classier. And it was the music that made the difference. So um, book Biagio for Taxi TV 2. Um, doing <clears throat> what he did in, in the ballroom, we couldn't do on Taxi TV because of the legal hoops that we had to jump through to get permission to use the, the scenes from the show, even though, <clears throat> excuse me, they were shows that uh, had already aired. It's still intellectual property. Um, anyway, <clears throat> the libraries, I, I couldn't help but think that the libraries would absolutely love what he was teaching. All right, let me go back up. I'm sure I missed a few other questions. <laughs> Jen Masumba music. Uh, would you ever considering taking the road rally on the road, maybe to Texas or Tennessee or somewhere more affordable to stay? Um, it's funny. The other day I was on the phone with somebody who had just gotten back from the uh, PMC, a production music conference, and they remarked how much nicer the hotel rooms for the road rally were and that they were a fraction of the price that the rooms were for the PMC, which is also in LA. So we know that we get a pretty good value out of the, a very good value out of the Westin. Um, however, no, I'm sorry to say, Jen, that we probably will never take the road rally out of town because um, it's free. And we generally have somewhere between 75 and 100 different speakers. So imagine if we now had to buy plane tickets for all those people to go to Texas or Tennessee and then two or three nights of hotel for each of them. Um, and then per diems for food for each of them. Um, it, it would easily make the road rally so ridiculously expensive that one of the reasons we're able to do it for free is because it takes place in LA and that's where the vast majority of our speakers come from. We don't need to buy plane tickets. We don't need to put very many people in hotel rooms. So sorry to say, not realistic. Um, moving down the line here. Um, Should all submissions to libraries have a one second of silence lead in? Um, typically, yes. Um, definitely not 10 seconds or 15 seconds or 30 seconds or a minute, just like a beat. Um, and listen to the beginning and the end of all your tracks with headphones on at a pretty high volume and, and do that religiously. Um, and also listen to every final mix all the way through. You would be really surprised how many tracks we get that have distortion or other audio things that you just wouldn't like um, or wouldn't want in your thing that end up in there because people hit the bounce button and go make a pot of coffee or go to the restroom or something. Um, okay, moving down. Here's one from Michael Bruce Miller. I've heard many times, don't submit for a friend. But if I sign a collaboration agreement with a friend and we both can, as long as your name is, you know, is on the copyright, even though you may not have registered the copyright, um, you can absolutely send that. You just can't submit something that was solely created by a friend. That gets really ugly uh, when somebody wants to license something and it turns out that the person who submitted it had no legal right to submit it. And now they're in 
the, the sequence of events because they're the person who submitted it through taxi. Um, Peach says it was amazing to watch Biagio work. Ken Messford, I wish you could have been there too, buddy. You would have really liked it. Uh, Jeff LaPlante has a question. I write a lot of cues that use utilize vocal chops as the lead melody as opposed to a synth lead. Way too many vocal elements to be considered instrumental cues. Any listings for that style? <clears throat> I want to be careful how I answer this, Jeff. Um, you will see in some of the listings, though, there are instrumental listings that w we get where um, the companies will say, if it's got vocalizations in it, like, whoa, 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 that would be acceptable in some cases, or yeah, 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 or um, bugga, boom, you know, using your voice as an instrument, not having actual lyrics, Maybe a word like go would be acceptable or, I don't know, I'm not thinking well under pressure. Vocalizations are oftentimes absolutely acceptable. Um, if your voice is being used as an instrument, the minute you start attaching a string of words in a sequence with a melody, then it becomes a lyric and it's not kosher. Um, but even if you had uh, a lot of, uh, Jeff's went on to say, way too many vocal elements to be considered instrumental cues. Um, honestly, I think that if, if you had an instrumental that was, let's say, just percussion, and you had a bunch of different vocalizations in there where vocals are like you're doing the bass part with a voice. Um, but no lyric, just boom, 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 boom. Um, probably, um, you know, there's so many particulars and ways that this could go north or south, east or west, that I hate to give a grossly general answer. But yes, vocalizations are often acceptable as part of instrumental tracks. The minute you start stringing several words together, or even a you know just a short phrase, melody and lyrics, then it becomes uh, a, a song with a lyric. But you know, uggs, woes, yay, go, <laughs> they're probably all fine. I'm scanning to find, do we have, yeah, we still have a couple minutes left. Um, question, is Ken's question legit? I don't know where Ken's question was. Did I miss it? I don't know if it was legit, but it was probably funny. <laughs> that much I know. I appreciate Ken's sense of humor, although I don't want to encourage him. <laughs> Um, seven likes away from being a hundred percent. Wow, that's cool. Um, all right, I think we're out of questions. What's for dinner? <clears throat> well, Carl, I don't know, but definitely Mrs. Wurzbach uh, is probably calling you. <laughs> and Ken Mesford says, yeah, don't encourage him. <laughs> oh, man, you guys. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in. I hope this was valuable stuff. And I will see you next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye -bye.